There comes a point in a filmmaker's life when, to describe how important and significant they are, you have to stop comparing them to other people and just say they are who they are. And I think Shane has crossed that Rubicon now. Oh, that's we don't, very we don't have to compare you to those other people anymore. <laughs> yeah. um, um, it sounds like you enjoyed that. I thought it was absolutely superb. It's, uh, it's a joy to be back with those characters again. Um, and presumably a joy for you as well to go and work with those actors again. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously I've not... Um, it's, a, it's a weird thing, obviously, unless you make sequels, which tend to, you know, in films, you tend to get gradually worse and you have less money as you go on. Mm. Um, in This Is England's been quite a rare thing, uh, that it was never meant to be, there was never meant to be a follow-on. And um, we, when Tomo, who plays um, Sean, his mum passed away about three months into... So we, we shot the original film, uh, 2005, uh, in September, and I think in December of that year, his mum passed away, and me and the cast went to the funeral, and it was kind of just the nature of that journey and going and all of us travelling up to Grimsby. That was the first time it went in my head of this is a bit more because you know it's like you go to weddings or you go to funerals and you say to people, "God, we really must see you again," and you never do. And mm -hmm. um, and films are a bit like that, you know, they're kind of. You, they're, they're such a high when you're doing them. Um, most people that come off them get the flu the second they come off and just get dead ill and yeah. spend six weeks in bed crying. <laughs> and they uh, <laughs> miss each other. Um, but, you, you know, they're quite a rare and strange beast. But there was something about that and something about the age of Tomo and the fragility of his situation that you saw all this love and warmth for him from everyone around him. And that was the first time it kind of entered my head that... Um, this was quite a special bond. Um, and, the, and then obviously you've got the other side of it, that it was based around the first important summer, really, of my life, and about a group of people that had, I had hung around with until about this age, yeah. when I first like, left to try and do something with my life. Um, so it covers a period, and the film can, films are weird because they can only really cover, you know, once you, you know, if you do one for 75 minutes, people complain on the internet because it's too short, you do one for two hours, the board, yeah. Um, whereas TV is this beautiful thing that it can change shape and be as long or as short as you want and those characters never really got chance to shine. Um, all the characters didn't really get chance to show themselves in the film. Well, it's, it's, it's apt, I think, that we're sitting here talking at the, uh, the TV festival because you were, your first love was, was cinema, really, wasn't it? That you used to go to the cinema and, you know, it took you out of yourself and you thought, I want to make films. Yeah, it was like a mixture because I, I was... It was, it's not like it is now, and he talks to us now, you know, finally got kind of the equivalent of a multiplex, it's got three screens, but ours used to be in a bingo hall, and so I'd watch things like Police Academy, E.T., um, uh, you know, um, all that kind of 80s and anything with Michael J. Fox in Team Wolf, um, <laughs> and uh, it's never been released on VHS in this country, sadly, I had to get an American copy of that, but... Uh, Scandal. But, but what my dad, my dad um, is into his motorbikes, and he's you know, a bit of a Hells Angel kind of thing, got all, all of these bikes. And he had this mate called Chris Eels, who was a really big Hells Angel, who had a massive pirate um, VHS collection, some which he'd taped, and, but he had this enormous collection of films um, and an enormous collection of westerns in particular. And, um, and so I used to walk over the fields from my house up to this, this guy's house, because he was mates with my dad, and get, he'd let me um, borrow four or five films at a time. I had a little, it was a bit like a video shop, but yeah. you know, without any fees, um, <laughs> and without any covers, just written in biro. <laughs> and I used to go back and me, me and my dad would sit and watch films together on a Sunday. Mm. So I might sit and watch three Westerns with my dad or, and you know, and then I just started. And then I, I realized that some of my favorite films, I didn't know about directors when I was 12 or 13, but then, you know, someone sort of said to me, what are your favourite films? And it turned out to be things like Mean Streets, mm. Raging Bull, Taxi Driver, you know, and then obviously your westerns, your, your classic spaghetti westerns. So I realised later on that I'd actually fallen in love with certain directors without realising... I didn't watch the credits, you know. No, it was, no. um, I didn't notice the names. Um, so my love of good films actually came from shitty VHS pirates <laughs> um, because my local cinema, you know, you'd like bed knobs and broomsticks were coming to Toxta 20 years after its release. <laughs> Um, I'm not even kidding. I, yeah. That came on. I was like, that, that, this isn't, that's not now. What, where's that from? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, when Police Academy came, that was a highlight because someone sat up on the beach and because it was a PG, but you saw boobs for about half a second mm. on the beach where someone went past on a quad bike. And I remember that being a highlight moment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, but I, I sort of, um, and then obviously when you're, 
you get to college, you know, and you start started on a photography course, then you suddenly meet these people that are actual film fans, you know, like really, and then I felt it was thick as shit, because <laughs> it was kind of like, I couldn't have those conversations, no. I couldn't enter those, I just knew what I liked, but I couldn't explain really why I liked it, you know. So you found your way into thinking, I want to make a film, you want to make films. I think, I think Mean Streets was the film that, that made me really truly want to make a film, because I, I'd always had this ability to sit in a pub or sit with a group of friends, and relay stories from where I'd grown up and, and make people laugh or, you know, and tell people some of these mental things that kind of gone on in my life. And I don't, I don't think I've had a particularly special or different life to anyone else. I think it's just the way that I remember detail mm -hmm. in a way. Um, and I remember emotional moments. My parents kind of hate me for the fact that I can remember, like, the good and the bad. And they're going, how do you remember that, you little shit? You know, it's, <laughs> it's um, kind of, I can remember all the depravity. <laughs> There's none of that sort of, uh, you know, I can, remember, I, I can remember kind of everything in such fine detail that I've always been able to relay it. But I didn't, the film was so completely out of my stratosphere that, that it really all began. I was watching Mean Street, something about that resonated with me, the fact that, Everyone at college was going on about, you know, The Godfather and then, and then Goodfellas came out. And obviously, a, amazing films, but, but not a community that I could relate to. I could relate to these... I grew up with a load of small-time crooks and, um, you know, and, and the ingenuity and stupidity that went hand-in-hand hand with these people that, um, and seeing the way that they, you know, the things they would pinch, the bravado with which they would pinch it. Um, and, um, you know, so I remember a couple of guys getting couldn't get home from a nightclub, so they stole, obviously they were gonna to have to steal a car to get back, so, but they stole a bread van with all cakes in it so they could eat. <laughs> and it's like, I just thought that if you're gonna get done, be full, you know. <laughs> <laughs> be really full, come back with all donut sugar around the mouths and that, like that, but pulled up in a fucking sun bless lorry. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, and so that, that was really the, the, the chrysalis where, where small time, I started to watch Mean Streets and kind of went, you know, De Niro, they're such the, the bottom feeders of, of the, you know, the mafia sort that, you know, they're, they're just right at the bottom. You know, Robert De Niro throws a little bomb in a bin for yeah. whatever reason, God only knows. And it reminded me of those people. And, and I'd done this, um, me and my mate Fraser to get some marijuana once had, um, the guy that we got it from had got all these dogs in a kennel and we'd got no money. And we just sort of said, look, we've got no money. What, is there anything else we can get that we could access and get and swap it for, for some weed? And, uh, and he said, basically, he, was, he had really high dog food bills. So if we could get him dog food, um, that he'd do an exchange. So this, uh, this shop opened, uh, you know, like Pets R Us UK, you yeah. know, uh, Pets R Us Utoxita, Paris and Brighton. And, uh, <laughs> but they'd over-ordered. This is honestly true. They'd over-ordered. And, and I sort of, this thing, the alarm bell, I thought, I've seen loads of dog food somewhere. Where have I seen that? And there was this, like... So they'd just opened the shop and at the back there was like an overspill area with dog food in that you could sort of see through the cracks around the back of this sort of like almost like where the lorries go to deliver mm. but because in your talks there was nothing to do you knew every inch of it um so uh, so i said i think i can get you some dog food how much would you like and he went well as much as you can get me and you know for every 50 tins i'll give you an eighth whatever it was so we went and me and fraser who, who ended up writing loads of my uh, films with me we went <laughs> in the broad daylight on a Sunday um, and opened, you know, broke these doors open, but then there was choice and we hadn't asked him what they ate. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, and this is a God's honest truth conversation, I'm kind of going, like, win a lot prime is, is obviously like, a, obviously, because I'd had dogs, I knew that was like 80, 80p a tin and Chappie was shit and <laughs> blah, 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 and so all of that. So anyway, so I, th I think whatever, whatever it was that we ended up picking, was the wrong one. So we pushed it through town, up through your tox to it, and just had a coat over the top of it, tip, tipped over in the high street, and it all rolled out. It was like the worst crime ever. <laughs> we didn't get caught, and then when we got there, it went, they won't eat that. And it, it was the good, no, we'd pick the good one, that's what yeah. we'd done. And he went, no, they don't, they, I don't want, and I don't want to feed him on that because they'll get used to it. <laughs> and, uh, and so he wouldn't do anything. I think he gave us, for, just for the endeavour, I think he gave us some really rubbish soap bar, uh, dope that was really shit and just expanded and didn't do anything. Um, and we went, <laughs> we went down an alleyway and just tipped, and it'll still be there, wherever that was. It'll still be <laughs> 600 kilos of Winnerlot Prime. Well, if, if, um, some people in here will have seen Small Time, your, yeah. your first movie, and that is in the film. Yeah. I mean, that, that is dramatised in the film, but it really happened. So that, that first film, that, which is about an hour long, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it qualifies as a, as a feature, your first feature. And I'm, I remember seeing that for the first time, obviously not knowing who you were, you were, you know. You were nobody. Yeah, and completely. And this film turned up, and it had such an energy to it. It's very funny, 
obviously, because the stories are funny. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's you and your friends with funny wigs on doing yeah. a lot of dancing. Yeah. And, and actually now with this far through your career, those things do recur. Yeah, you it, know, it, you it like, is you a... You like to show people who will know each other well enough having a bit of a dance. That's something that comes through still. Yeah, because, commu- you know, it, it, obviously things are changing now, you know, just in terms of what the way technology has kind of gone, you know, just the nature of society is slightly different. You know, we literally... Um, we was, you couldn't help but be close to people. And in, in a small town as well, um, if you had a problem with someone, it was unavoidable. Um, you know, it's like, obviously, in a big city, you can, you could, if you had a bit of conflict with someone, you, you can walk away. You're never going to see that person again. Mm-hmm. But in your Toxter, I believe that someone in 1066, like, flicks someone on the arse with an elastic band, and the, the, the ripple effect's been going on. It's like he went and whacked his brother for doing it. It's one of them places where, literally, you just end up with... You can't avoid people. It's a really small town. Mm-hmm. And, and, but then that also created this kind of closeness. Um, where you were in each other's pockets and roaming the streets and all of those kind of things. And sm- when I saw, I think I saw Mean Streets and kind of went, I, you know, obviously my, these people I've got are nowhere near as cool as De Niro and Keitel, mm. but ultimately it made me think I've maybe got something that's individual to me because all these people at college were doing, you know, writing versions of Reservoir Dogs, writing versions of, you know, these films, Man Bites Dog, and, you know, and so they do a little project in black and white with a sort of serial killer talking to Cameron. You can hear it's just a, just a poor rip-off of something that they loved. Um, whereas I think with Small Time, it was kind of like, because it was close to home um, and because I'd grown up inside of it, uh, you had a slightly different angle. So you were kind of telling the story from inside rather than looking through the window, you mm. know. And that, I mean, that launched your career in that uh, the people noticed you as like a calling card for you. Um, so then your, your second film, 24-7, was BBC Films, uh, yeah. gave some money to, for you to do that. It's in black and white. And Bob Hoskins, you managed to uh, talk Bob Hoskins to be in it, who was a, you know, who's a big name. And again, it's a personal film. It's based on your own experiences, a, bo- a boxing club. Um, but of course, all of a sudden, you've gone up Technically, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to look at. Yeah. So you, you quite quickly went from, from filming on old-fashioned, big, fat video equipment that you borrowed to doing a proper film. Yeah, and I'll be honest, I, I really... It, it, uh, it stressed me out, actually, the transition. Um, I found it really scary because um, there's something beautiful about not having financiers, you know, and I think I'm, I won... Where's the Money Ronnie won about 5,000 quid in a film competition... And at the time, I was, you know, I was on 30 quid a week on the dole, so that was like a small fortune, you know. Um, and I made small time with that money, so I was kind of financing it myself. And so I think the reason I'm, I'm here now is because I was able to make mistakes privately. And there's something about when you're going in for meetings um, that, you know, I remember walking on set for the first day, and it's a very strange and quite surreal experience because what we had on... We hired a, a minibus on small time, Went to Aldi, did a shop, went to a wig shop, bought 10 wigs, went to a charity shop, bought some costumes and made a film. Mm-hmm. And then, so there were, that, that was it. You know, and there was literally the people up the street were the cast members. People had become friends with the woman next door who was a single mum, a lady up the road that used to be a Murphy's mob and had never acted in 10 years, and friends and people that had been in my short films. Um, and, um, and then I walked on set and nothing can kind of prepare you for caravans and, you know, there was literally people out the back of vans soaring and it was like, it was like a little miniature city. And I, I honestly shit myself and I remember, I remember treading water for like two days pretending I knew what I was doing. Um, and uh, and I, I, I can't even describe this, it was like massive anxiety because you've got 40 or 50 pairs of eyes looking at you kind of going, what now? Gaffer, you know, and you're kind of like, and it's it's quite a scary proposition, yeah, and that because you're a very young man. Yeah, I think I think I was 23. I think it's amazing. Um, and you know, but obviously, but but what was amazing is I've seen crews since then. I was really lucky because I could have been put off forever because I, I've seen crews brutalise directors. I've seen crews brutalise actors. I've seen actors brutalise productions. You know, I've, you get to see all of it. But on that, Bob Hoskins was he was the one that set the tone. <laughs> And so he kind of went in there. So if a producer started trying to take the piss out of me or telling me that I was shooting too much stock or anything like that, he would put his foot down on my behalf and kind of shouted me for the first two or three weeks. Mm. Um, and that made an enormous difference because ultimately I then got my feet and got my confidence. Um, but suddenly having conversations with, you know, people coming up to you from the sound department and that wasn't good for me and makeup that wasn't good. And actually realising it's kind of like, well, I've always gone with 
did it feel emotionally right? And now you've got 12 people going, not good for me. You never get one take where everyone's going happy. Yeah. And, and so, and it's like, so it's a lot. It was like I went to university in six weeks. I did a three year degree in six weeks. Mm. Um, but I, I must honestly, hand on heart, say if it wasn't for Bob, I, I think two weeks in, I'd just been sectioned, you know. Yeah. Well, you, you, by the time you made This Is England, the film This Is England, um, which fits into, you know, themes that you looked at before. Uh, it's autobiographical to, to a degree in that Sean is kind of you, isn't he? Certain yeah. parts of you are in, in Sean. I didn't even notice that his name being Sean Fields was a pun on your name. <laughs> yeah. I've only worked that out, I think, last week. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry about that. But uh, it was very good. Uh, it's a good Layers. pun, but it was subtle. And, and so you'd made that film, and it was well-received. People were really into it. And after that, I think I read in an interview you said you felt there was more in the characters to do, which is a little bit talking about what you talked yeah. about going to uh, the, the funeral and wanting to be with those people again. But you said that that film felt to you like it was a prequel to all your other contemporary films. Yeah, yeah, completely, because that film is really about the formation of me, you know, taking this kid that was being bullied and then putting him in with the bulliers, if you like, you know, putting, you know, because obviously Woody's side of it, they were great, you know, those kind of, uh, the skinheads that were into the reggae and into the, the fashion and, you know, but that, then obviously there was this National Front side to things. Um, and so to be sort of, as an as a 11 year old kid that's being, you know, bullied at school, like a lot of kids, you know, you kind of go to the, the first big school, I was getting fucking brutalized. And, um, and, and I can remember walking through town and seeing, it was like, it was really mad because it was literally like one minute everyone was just into David Bowie and then the next minute there was a load of soldiers at the stop in these massive boots with green bomber jet and just going, what is that? That looks ace. Yeah. You know, and everyone's scared of that. I want to be in that just so I literally don't get my head kicked in. Mm. And sort of, you know, my sister became a skinhead girl. She started going out with a skinhead a bit like Woody, this guy called Pecker, um, who was ace and he, he, you know, and he used to take me out hunting so he was the kind of guy that would go on these mad, and they took me in this guy, Gadget, um, who was you know, a friend of mine from Utopsita, and the first time I went hunting, it was snowing, and, um, and they, it was one of them where they like, got us up at 4 a.m., and they were gonna basically, they said they were only gonna let one small person into the gang, so they were gonna have this like, sort of winter Olympics, where me and him <laughs> had, to com we had to compete against each other in, in the fucking freezing cold up hills in rivers, um, and they had five events, and, uh, and I walked out the house, and there was a pile of stuff. I've never seen anything like it. Um, fur coats, you name it, just, and, and bikes, you know, and just, it was a joke, and there was just written in the snow, it was a big arrow, and it just said, carry this, you. And <laughs> so I picked up all this stuff and went off on this mental day. And even though, um, you know, it was, because me and Gary, I think, he won all the strength events, and I won the sort of sinewy stuff. But then we got to the, <laughs> when we got, I think we were two, two events each, I, and uh, we'd had a wrestling match on a hill in the snow. And uh, I'm not kidding. And, and then they caught a baby rabbit and they basically said, you know, whoever can kill the rabbit, you know, you're gonna have to learn, you know, cause it, I, was, I was in quite a rural community and hunting was, I mean, my dad used to eat rabbits. And, and so, uh, and I was like, oh, I'll do that easy. You know, and I got this hammer, I couldn't do it. And, you know, I was looking in this rabbit's eyes and Gadget went to do, give me the hammer like that. And he looked at it and he was looking up at him like that and he started crying <laughs> and he let, he let the rabbit go and it just ran off and, and got its life back. And, um, and then, so they just kind of, by default, we both got in. Um, <laughs> uh, they changed the rules. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. just, yeah, they sort yeah. of, yeah, they just let us both in so they could keep doing that for the next five years. Um, and that, so, but all of a sudden, I kind of belonged to something, you know, and it did transition and it did change, but it was like, so this is England is, you know, Bit, having access to those people. I mean, in my house, I'd always had access to a crazy world. My dad always had these amazing friends. You know, you'd come downstairs on a Sunday morning and there'd be like, you know, four pairs of legs stinking of farts. You know, mates have come back from the pub. Um, and it was like, you know, it was just kind of a, a crazy and beautiful life where you got access to things um, and to characters that, you know, in today's society, I'd just be sat playing uh, Angry Birds, you yeah. know, I wouldn't get anywhere near it. Yeah. Um, but I think that was the form, I think the stories, I became like a sponge and I think, um, I think the stories and the, the beginning of the storyteller began then. And that's why that is kind of like a prequel because that takes the little kid who's having little tattoos put on himself, who's doing it really, Sean's doing it because he's lost his father and he's looking for a father figure. 
And I think for me, because my dad was a lorry driver, I had this sadness because he used to work away a lot. Mm. So there was these similarities, you know. If uh, um, you seem to have avoided the trap, which a lot of um, successful rock bands do, which is they write their first album and it's all about their life up to that point and everyone loves it. Then they have to write the second album and they write it about being on tour. Yeah. And so <laughs> no longer can anyone relate to what, they're, what yeah. they're writing about. And that happens all the time because that's their life now, being in a bus, being in a hotel. You have managed, and it may be, because you, you've now sort of started to mine your, your childhood. Yeah. Um, you've managed to avoid that. You, you've always make films about personal things in small communities. That tends to be the thing that you, you're interested in. And obviously, This Is England has turned into more than just one-off. It's now this continuing story. And you've said that, that this is the end of it. The, these yeah. four episodes will be the end of it. Um, and you've also said they might not be, but you know, the yeah. idea is this is the end of the story, isn't it? Yeah, well, because obviously at the end of 88, I, I always knew at the end of 88 that that wasn't a full stop in, you know, it was like, um, it didn't, you know, resolve. It opened up almost like more, suggested more than it kind of finished and dealt with. Um, so I always knew there was one to do. And, and then I kind of obviously, I was planning on going back in and the Stone Roses film opportunity came up. And, uh, and that, you know, that was just one of those things that as a kid, you, you know, that, that after the skinhead phase, the, the Manchester movement was the first thing I truly fell in love with. Obviously, yeah. I attached myself to the skinhead um, movement, you know, and obviously still love toots and specials and, you know, all of the sort of music in that time. But I was really just a, an 11 year old kid that was tagging along. And so when the Stone Roses thing came up, it delayed the final This Is England. And I think what's lovely about that is it's a bit like you say with recording albums, bands tend to struggle, you know, it might take five years, six years, whatever it takes. Some people come quick, but you tend to have so much material to go into that first album and then people want one the year later. Mm. And that's sometimes the problem, I think, with TV in general is that it's almost so, so accessible and you, you know it's coming on September every year that sometimes when there's a delay, for whatever reason, it's actually helped this. I'd, I only realised the other day it's been four years which is obviously yeah. you know, a, fair, a fair amount of time, but rather than people giving up on it, it feels like people are actually oh, more yeah. excited. You know, Because yeah. when we didn't do it, I sort of thought maybe we'll never be able to go back again because it, you know, people will have forgotten about it. But weirdly, it just shows you that if you can't have everything so immediate now, um, you, can, you, know, you want to download a whole series all in one go and just watch it all in a one whack. So it's quite, it seems to be quite nice that we've waited, I think. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about it. TV is the only place you could really do this the way you're doing it. You could have made each of the two that you've made and this one as a film. Yeah. But that was, it may, you may never have got there. There's something about the, the length, the length of the thing. So it's like a you know, four, hour, four hour film, isn't it? Each one roughly. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful medium because um, I tend to work to the, I didn't, I didn't know how it was going to work and, and working to part breaks is a really good training because weirdly, because Obviously, when it goes onto a DVD, those part breaks are taken yeah. away. But you start to um, you start to craft things together to sort of because you know people are going to go off and have a cup of tea, and <laughs> you end up sort of. So it sounds more cheesy than it actually is. It just gives you these little bits of punctuation, and I and I really like the shape of those that sort of length of time that then basically you have to take a week away and you come back a week later and it keeps moving forward and it keeps evolving. Um, I didn't know how I'd take to it, and, and that at, when, I, when we did 86, there was nothing really around, because people now, had, you know, Fargo's turned up, you know, there's a lot of things that are spinning off, but at the time, I think the only thing I could think of that had been done was a, a not very successful follow-on to um, Lockstock, oh, yeah. which seemed to yeah. be more of a cashing-in thing than it did mm. about, you know, genuinely want, having more stories to tell. So at the time, it was, there was no pressure on me. There's much more pressure on me now than when I did the first one, yeah. because the first one, everyone was just... You know, let's see what happens. No one's really done it before. And and Tom Harper directed two of the first yeah. series, which was interesting. So was that your decision? You, you, yeah, well, I because I, you I, wrote I, I it with, with Jack Thorne. Well, I, I, knew, I knew that um, you know because me and Jack, we kind of write them and it, we put the same effort in as as I would on any film. Every stage of this is done like I would do a film. So we use the same cameras, the same size of crew. We shoot for roughly the same amount of time. Uh, which is, you know, TV's normally, from what I've seen, you've got to shoot this many pages a day. If you're only on page one and by half past eight at night and you've still got 13 to do, you're just doing them. Yeah. Um, no matter what one take, it, as long as it's on the, you know, as long as it's in the can. Um, whereas with this, you know, Channel 4, that's one of the things that when we sat down, I kind of said, look, I'm not going to, 
I'm not making TV as a step down and oh, you know, it's nice and easy and I'll put my feet up. Um, so when I looked at it, I sort of thought four hours, you know, because the edit of This Is England took nine months. Um, so I was in my head thinking it was going to be, I didn't want to be doing an 18 month because every two, mm. roughly two films. Mm. As it's turned out, they do, because the cast are now much more seamless when they improvise and because I now use multiple cameras mm. so I can get much more natural takes. Um, a lot of the stuff that you see there will be shot, like when the father and the son are having the conversation on the phone and there's the split screen, um, they're in the same house and they've got an earpiece in, so they're actually, you know, and the, and the traditional way of shooting that is obviously one person pretends they can hear the yeah. line or, um, so uh, we built the bedroom upstairs and turned it into, so in Woody's house, we turned one of the rooms into his dad's right. room. Um, just, just for that natural thing. So a lot. So it has actually streamlined massively. So when I did that with Tom, I wouldn't have, the series wouldn't have happened because I just would never have thought in my head I could direct four episodes. Right. If someone was asking me to go and direct four episodes of you know something for ITV or something, and you're just turning up, you turn up the grade for one day, you turn up at the mix and go, yeah, that sounds all right. You know, it'd be slightly different, but because I knew, you know, because. Um, I think the quality was massively important that I didn't let that slip. Everything is personal with, with, with you. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Can I, um, I'll throw it open because there may be other questions. We've got about another 10 minutes, so if anyone's got a question for Shane about that or, or, or anything else, um, please do put your hand up. And yes, are we uh, doing mics or are we just I shouting? Oh, shout. You can, but there's a mic coming if you want to. Here it comes. Have the fun of having a mic. It's pretty cool. Hello, mind. Shane. Um, uh, Kat Spooner from Endemol, it doesn't matter. I love your work. Oh. Um, what process do you go through when you're developing characters with the actors? Um, I've heard that you do months and months of workshops and they create real memories for the characters which they can then bank on when they're um, acting, when you're shooting them. Yeah, I mean, it sort of begins... I mean, it's this, this one's been... Um, because the characters are so fully formed now, um, that, that the nature of rehearsals on this one, I actually did very, very minimal rehearsals. Me and Jack were, were in like the equivalent of Crossroads Motel around the corner from my house. We just sat in a little motel room and we wrote it, sit down, write an episode because the characters are so alive. Woody's one of those people now that um, me and Jack can actually, you can, he just talk, it's like he doesn't talk to you, but you can actually, you know when something's right and wrong. So when, you, when you're creating characters on something for the first time, you, I always need the actor's input to make that person a real person. But on 90, because you know the fundamental way in which that person would talk what they would or wouldn't say, it's, it was a massive help, I think, this time. But in terms of how 86 came about when you brought in someone like Mick, um, we do, um, sometimes we just, we, we'll act all day and then other times, I'll just put two or three pieces of music on that have been getting into me or getting in my bloodstream and kind of sitting and playing them to people to set the tone. I've sent people off um, as a group of people to try and build some history. So like Kelly, um, Mick and Chrissy would go off for the day in Sheffield and people, I'd send people off bowling and doing, going looking for carpets. And just because it's like, if, <laughs> if you rehearse, sometimes I've, I've lost things in rehearsal that I can never get back. Some things are only meant to come out once. So I very, very rarely, I use a read-through. Me and Jack did the read-through on uh, 86, and one of the episodes just was not reading off the page. The others were leaping off. And I wrote on my script, as it was next to me, I can't remember what the exact words were. It was something like, this is, bit, this is really boring, isn't it? Or this is shit, whatever it was. And me and Jack then spent the next day completely rewriting that episode. And that's, it's a really good opportunity that's a really nice way of working out if your script's got the right vibe. Um, but, but ultimately, a lot of it for me is just about new characters coming in, giving them some sort of sense of history. So they've got a few memories. You can't create a whole life, obviously. But if people have a couple of days of hanging around together and doing things, little subtle things creep in and little memories creep in and, and little things for them to kind of lean on. Um, so, you know, I, I think very early on, I probably over-rehearsed some things. Um, and now I try and... there's a There's a... I think it's in episode three, there's a scene in, in there which is an entire part is just all set in, in one place and it's all done in one take with nine cameras in a little council house. Um, and that's one of the things from the series I'm probably most proud of of all of it because it harks right back to when I, was, I had so little money I had to shoot things in one take. And um, so it's almost like going back to the beginning but I think the actors in that scene are just a another level um, and a lot of that I was so lucky I inherited um, 
the work that we did early doors, I don't have to kind of go in and do it every time, if that makes sense. It's now, we do bits, but now that they've built up and they're all so used to being together, and they hang around together all the time, you know, the nightmare around Sheffield, so. <laughs> um, uh, I, I predict at some point in the future, you will be all back together again, I think. I, don't, I can't see how well, you Yeah, well, I said, I said it's a full stop in pencil, because yeah. you're kind of like, how can you... Um, <laughs> How can you know? Um, and, you know, the one thing I won't do is I won't ruin the legacy on purpose. You know, I won't kind of cash it in. And I've done enough in this that if I never come back, then, you know, I don't feel like I've left it open-ended. Mm. Um, but, um, but, you know, there's, there's something about this. I don't know why it grew the way it did. Um, you know, I've got... I do want to make a, a film next, and I've got um, something that I'm st uh, not far off announcing for, for television that I'm probably going to uh, oversee help write and do but I probably I probably won't direct so that I can direct a film um, but uh, so I've got I've, the next few years look like they're sorted but you just you know you never know with them lot they're very addictive <laughs> <laughs> do you have any other questions yeah there's a hand up right there if you can just hang on for the mic Hi uh, Shane uh, Tom Latch from Freelance Journalist um, uh, how much did hanging out with the Stone Roses uh, before you made this influence what we're going to see in this series and also what can we expect because actually there wasn't much darkness in that episode uh, <laughs> having a fight was the darkest thing that happened yeah um and obviously you're known for you know in previous uh, series for being it's, it can be quite dark but actually this period where ecstasy came to the uk yeah um the bad things that were happening in society were forgotten in many ways by people because they were going out and partying all the time and taking ecstasy so uh, it, is it less dark than previous ones? Um, the first episode is. Um, <laughs> uh, it, definitely, uh, it definitely gathers momentum uh, as it goes on. I mean, my, my work, I, I, I could, someone who, who's, you know, great at dissecting films could probably explain why my stuff get, becomes like that. You know, I don't, there's like a vacuum that starts and it turns on in this definitely <laughs> at about the halfway point. Um, and it maybe that's just the shape of what this is England kind of is. But yeah, you know, it's um, and th this this is a different challenge as well because it's done over four seasons. Um, and doing a first episode after you've been away from people for four years, you've kind of got to reintroduce. It was, it was quite a difficult thing to try and get right. And I just sort of decided, you know, with Jack, we sort of sat there and went, let's just make each one as it feels because they are seasonal and there's three months between them. We know what the end point is and we know it it gets pretty heavy. But ultimately, do we have to feed loads of that into the front just so people are prepared for it? Well, maybe let's just make that a spring, and then as it moves its way through, as long as the increments work, uh, which I think they do, um, you know, that it kind of comes... I mean, the Stone Roses, what, what bizarrely, rather than a sort of um, emotional thing that happened on the Stone Roses affecting this, it was actually when I shot Heaton Park, we, I think on one of the Heaton Park shows, because you've got to shoot something live, and obviously the band, you know, they can't go back on if they do a bad song, you know, if you miss an angle. So I think one night we had about 30 cameras at this place with 75,000 people. And I'm known as, you know, Ken Loach with jokes, kitchen sink drama. And suddenly I'm there with these 30 cameras. And once I actually thought, well, that wasn't, it wasn't easy because it's really stressful. But at the same time, it was no harder uh, than, than working with two or three cameras if you've got decent cameramen. And, and so what it did is like that scene I was just saying where we were in this uh, house... In the old days, you just follow the rhythm of everyone, you know, get one camera and then have to reenact it. You know, you do a wide, you do a couple of mids, and then you do everyone's close up. That's like seven or eight takes. So, if that's a really, really intense scene, you're not going to kind of get the shape. It can't be the same each time. So, the Stone Roses, we basically, there's a photograph that exists of this ridiculous mount. The scene's the most natural thing I've probably ever shot, but in the room, it was like the Daleks had invaded it. <laughs> because one half of the room was just cameras and blankets and people <laughs> trying to hide with stuff all on their faces. And, uh, and these, this camera rig in the centre with cameras... To be able to make something incredibly natural, I had to shoot in a really technical way. And if it wasn't for the Stone Roses and shooting on those multiple cameras, I never would have ever probably shot that scene in that way and it would not look how it looks. And I'm not saying it's the greatest scene ever made, but in terms of getting something pure, um, that really opened my eyes because, you know, you think of nine cameras and you think of James Bond, you know. <laughs> so to think of nine cameras in a room about that big, um, it, it really opened my eyes. We've got, uh, we've got time for one more question, if there is one. Right, right down the front here, yes. Reminded me of growing up in Stoke 
Uh, yeah. yeah. So it's a question about dead man's shoes, if you didn't hear that first part of it. Yeah, well, as I was saying about the, the sort of, um, you know, the funny side of growing up in, in your top gym, growing up in a small place, um, when drugs kind of came in to that community, um, I saw a lot of changes, you know, and especially when uh, heroin um, came along. I was really lucky because I, I did, I tried everything that everyone else tried as just as part of growing up. And, um, and, I, and I went to Burton Tech where I met Paddy when I was about 16 or 17 and ended up sleeping on Paddy's floor for like a year because it was just easier to go to college because I didn't have to, you know, travel to Burton on the bus. So, and I ended up like living in Burton. It's almost like over the course of that year, heroin came and, uh, and took lives, not, not many, but friends, you know, overdosed. Some people started robbing their parents. You know, it was kind of, it was unbelievable. I've never seen anything ransack a community like that. Um, and although a lot of those people have got their lives back now, there was something about that um, that I think, where a small time was the funny, ha you know, small time was the spring episode. Um, and and that, that, that kind of rears its head um, I'm not saying it's heroin specifically, but the drug thing, there is a come down to this, you know, and the high that comes with the summer of love. Um, and obviously, <laughs> it's a shame Meadow's summer of love. So my, my summer of love, <laughs> that night I went to the Hacienda, someone got stabbed in the knee and they shut it down and I didn't get in. And then when I, my, I went to my first rave and we couldn't find it. And then when we, when we did actually hear these like drumming and we went, we found it, it was a pagan festival and there was a druid there with a big sword. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and it was in the Daily Mirror, you can actually find this image, because there was all these, everyone was dancing around with their boobs out and that, and, uh, <laughs> and it wasn't a rave, but we sort of turned it into one, and, um, and pretended we'd been to the actual rave that everyone else had been to, but we hadn't. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who were there at the time expecting me to be right on point doing really cool gigs with 5,000 people and that and whistles and glow sticks and everyone freaking out <laughs> till four in the morning and they're just going to get a big bloke with a beard and, and some fish soup. <laughs> <laughs> so, if, you, uh, if you'd never got your hands on a camera, uh, you'd still be sitting somewhere telling these stories. And, yeah, quite possibly. I'm glad you did and I think we'll all agree we're glad you did because you can show us your films and tell us the stories occasionally. Oh, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's always a great pleasure talking to you, Shane, and thanks for all of you for coming, but perhaps you'd like to show your appreciation to Shane Meadows. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um.